Hi, it's Benjamin, and welcome back to another episode of Grandma's Room. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I'm here with Joffrey, and today we're going to be talking about My Trip to Mars, the Moons, and Venus by Buck Nelson, and like Karashe, which is in the former Soviet Union. Okay. Would you like to dip your toe in the old honey jar? I would like to tell you uh, the fucked up dream I had. Yes. Before. Dude. It's it's super quick. It was just really weird. So, like, every morning, the first thing I do when I wake up, I let Myra outside. And this is how the dream started. But Terry was out there, too. So I walk outside. Terry walks out behind me. But Myra's not out there. Like, I didn't take her out for some reason. And, like, as soon as I walk out, I see this huge white wolf. Standing on all fours, it's, like, as tall as I am. It's fucking massive. <clears throat> and then Terry's, like, walking across the parking lot. Not the parking lot, or driveway. Yeah. The wolf's standing on the other side of it. So he's walking, talking to me, about to, like, unbuckle his pants because he's going to take a piss. And I'm just staring at this wolf. I'm like, dude. And he, <clears throat> like, turns around. He's like, oh, my God. So we're just having this stare off with this huge white wolf. It's not scary or anything. Like, it's all calm. And then next thing you know, the thing starts fucking hunching over and shitting. So this wolf's taking a giant shit, and literally the minute, like the second he's done shitting, it turns around, eats it, and starts bucking around like a like a bull, like you know, like a bull riding bull. Yeah. It just starts bucking, but not as erratic. Like it's calm about it. Like it kind of looks like it's dancing, and it's over. <laughs> so the wolf took a shit, ate it, and started dancing. Pretty much, it was such a weird dream. You know, our dog David, uh, in one day he shit on the stairs twice, which he's only shit in the house two times ever, aside from this. Uh, yesterday, uh, so he shits on the stairs twice and eats it both times. Ew. Mom was not a happy camper. <sighs> Silly dog shits for humans. Yeah, I sent you that video of him humping aggressively. Might I add, humping the uh. Oh god. Dude, he went at it even harder last night. It was fucking hilarious. <laughs> Joe and I he's, were laughing, and Mom was upset. He's in his adolescent stage. Yeah, he's going through puberty at what, like six months. <laughs> six months. <laughs> I mean, yeah, for a dog, what's that? Like, uh, I guess it's like three and a half years old human ears. Yeah. So, I guess. I'm pretty sure a three and a half year old is not trying to fuck his uh his bed. He's an early bloomer. Yeah. We'll just say that. So, yeah. Yeah. That's the latest dog news from us. Yeah. So, you want to start your thing? Sure. Okay. So, I decided to do, like, Karashe. And it is a lake, like I said, in Russia, uh, about 1,800 miles away from Moscow. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, the world found out about the horror of Lake Karashe. And standing at the edge of the lake back in 1991, when the Soviet Union fell, standing on the edge of the lake for an hour gave off so much radiation that would kill you. Uh, and this was because of the Mayak facility. Is that, like, the name, or is that, like, a chemical? It's the name of, like, the place they made it. Okay. So, after the U.S. nuked Japan in World War II, Russia was eager to get their hands on their own nuclear warheads, which, surprise, surprise, that's what they wanted. It's a superpower. Yeah. You need to compete. So, City 40 was built to house all the scientists to help build Russia's first nuclear bombs, and was codenamed Shelyabinsk 40. I'm sorry, I, but I butchered that. Um, it was named after, uh, or I'm sorry, it was codenamed Shelyabinsk 40. Shelyabinsk 40 was named after the city Shelyabinsk, and it is about 90 kilometers away. Uh, and it has this code name because it wasn't even meant to be like, like no one was supposed to know about it because it's, it's the equivalent of a. Like where, Area 51? No, where did we make our bombs um, out in New Mexico? The Los Alamos, Los Alamos Proving Grounds or whatever? Yeah, yeah. It's the equivalent of that. So, like, obviously, you don't want anyone to know about it. And so, like, it wasn't on any maps. Uh, it wasn't in public records. Not that Soviets can look through public records. Um, but, so, scientists who worked on the project were kept in the dark, uh, being ordered to just get, like, sometimes they just be told, be here and get in this unmarked car, and then they disappear for, like, 10 years. Like the families, their families out there are dead. So they oh, like know... they they couldn't even tell their family, like, "Hey, I'm going. I'm just leaving for a while." Yeah. Um. 
No one could tell their families, and once they reached City 40, no one had any communication with the outside world. And City 40 was built by prisoners in the Gulag, so you can imagine how bad that probably was for them. I was going to say, like, was it built correctly? Like, was it, like... They kind of made it sound like a utopia. Like, okay. everything was cool there. It was, like, beautiful. The, like, like after, the, I guess, the prisoners were gone? Yeah, yeah. Um, the leaders in charge of uh, City 40 were concerned more about getting a bomb for Stalin instead of the safety of the scientists. This doesn't sound like utopia, but everything other than this is, mm. like, awesome. But that also doesn't sound surprising for the Soviet Union. Yeah. Um, the conditions were so bad that scientists handled raw nuclear materials with no protection, uh, just their bare hands. And that's, like, a common theme throughout this, like, story, which I thought that was kind of insane. I mean, I'm not putting it past Russia. Yeah, but you'd to... think, like, their top scientists, they'd want to keep them as long as they could, protect them so they don't die early. I don't know. But uh, despite having terrible working conditions, life wasn't too bad for the workers, uh, they got more food, like rations, and they had like nice apartments compared to everywhere else in the Soviet Union. Uh, this is like a quick side note. Uh, this is like right after World War II, so Russia is like ravaged, and you're living in utopia, building bombs. Oh yeah, like the rest of the countries. I mean, how far did the Nazis make it in? They got to what? They got um, to like Stalingrad, and then that kind of turned it around, right? Mm. So where's Stalingrad in <clears throat> comparison to this? I don't know. But my point is that, like, half the country is, like, living oh, in yeah. poverty. And, and you're living millions of people. Yeah, and you're living like a king. I mean, not bad for the scientist, I guess, except for, like, puking up blood and yeah. <laughs> their bones going hollow. Uh, they also were given health care and even, uh, an even better ki- education than they already had. So they're already, like, really smart, and they're just being taught even more stuff. And, uh... However, if scientists didn't want to comply, Soviet soldiers would just take them to the outside of City 40's limits and just kill them. So kind of a utopia. Kind of. Sounds like the dream to me. Yeah. Uh, the first Mayak facility reactor was completed in 1948. and that same year, the Mayak facility started to dump nuclear waste in a nearby river called the Teka, which was the only water source for many Russian towns. So they just like fucked over all these towns to begin with and uh a year later russia developed their first nuclear bomb and city 40 city 40 finally got into its like own groove of like mass producing bombs and the scientists were given the privilege to debate pretty much whatever they wanted and could read like a shit ton of books that they wouldn't have been able to read before Mm -hmm. so that's kind of the utopia for the soviets in my mind um after three years of dumping waste into the Tekka, uh, the rest of the world decided Russia uh, couldn't just, you know, keep doing that. And they made plans to build reservoirs to dump the waste into. And until they were done, uh, they decided to dump the nuclear waste in Lake uh, Karache, which was, like, right next to the city. And uh, it said by this point, this is, what, 1951, I think? Yes, it's 51. Uh, the radiation measures at 200 million curies. I don't know how much that is. I feel like that's a lot, though. 200 million? The only... I don't know if this is, this is like, um, like a standard versus metric system. The only one I know okay. of is, like, row engines from before, like when we talked about Chernobyl. Mm. I don't know what, what is... Do you know what curies are in comparison to row engines? I'm just going to Google it because we're being a little foolish. Because I remember when Chernobyl melted down, remember we were talking about that, and they had the soldiers in there just, like, pretty much shoveling up radioactive material, and almost all of them died or got, like, cancer and shit. Okay, one Curie equals 3.7 times 10 to the 10th power disintegrations per second. I don't know what that means. Yeah, I mean, It sounds like a lot. Let's just say it's dangerous. Yeah, it does not sound like a place I'd want to live. Mm-mm. Okay, so fast forward three years, you get the reservoir, or no, I'm sorry, six years, you get the reservoirs built underground, and after an underground cooling system and the underground tank that stored nuclear waste broke, excuse me, mind you, this this cooling system 
it went for a year unnoticed, and then one day it just blew up. Like blew up, blew up. Uh, it had on September twenty ninth, nineteen fifty seven. Uh, it had the same power as seventy tons of TNT. It exploded. Yeah, and it blew like the top off of this like thing. It this is a little comparison. You remember back whenever we dropped the, like the mother of all bombs. In Afghanistan, uh, a couple years, like Trump's first year in office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember that and how like everyone was, thought that was like the biggest explosion or bomb in the world. It was the biggest non-nuclear bomb. Okay, that is only a seventh of the size of this explosion. Oh wow. Okay, first I need to fact check myself. I think it was the biggest non-nuclear bomb dropped. I think it was a hydrogen, the biggest hydrogen bomb. What the father of all bombs? I mean the Moab. No, isn't hydrogen bomb? Isn't that nuclear? That's because I thought that they said that was the biggest conventional bomb dropped, and I think Russia had the biggest bomb at all. They just didn't drop it. I think theirs was the father of all bombs, and ours was called the mother of all bombs, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure. I I, okay. I, I looked it up like right after it happened, so that was years ago. Just how powerful was the Moab? The Moab, okay, not important, not important, not important. Okay, its blast radius is one mile. Okay, wait. I'm what trying to find uh, How big was the Moab? I'm just seeing what's made of. Hydrogen bomb. Yeah. It is I'll look up is a hydrogen bomb nuclear. Is the largest non nuclear bomb ever used. That's a hydrogen bomb. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, you're fine. Okay. So uh it also made a cloud of strontium and cesium. And for those of you like me who are not inclined in science that's a bad mixture to be breathing in. Those are radioactive. Yes, they are. So, uh, it was just blown over all these towns over the Soviet Union because obviously you can't control a cloud. And uh, many people were told just to stick it out and not leave and you'd be fine. But It'll wear off. Yeah, they were told to go out and just like just brush the stuff off their roofs and uh, just wipe it off their windows with their hands. But... uh. So eventually, 10,000 people were evacuated, but by that point, you're already dead. Um, yeah. Not surprisingly, many people were taken to the hospital, and again, not surprisingly, no one knows exactly how many people died. Um, uh, once the public knew what happened, uh, it was labeled as the as a level 6 accident. So this is in 1991. It's labeled a level 6 accident. It's, what's on a, like what levels are there? Does it stop at like ten? I don't know, but only Chernobyl and the Fukushima. Uh, After the tsunami hit Japan. Yeah, melted. those are the only two that outrank. So pretty big. Yeah. Um. I wonder what Chernobyl would be. I wonder what level that would be. Eight or nine. I don't think they can give it a perfect score. Yeah. Or maybe we're jumping to conclusions. Maybe it's only eight. Sorry, I keep I keep interrupting. No, you're fine. I, I have questions. Uh. All right, so 10 years later, uh, so now back to the actual lake itself. Um, so 10 years later, it, it was like super cold in the winter, and uh, and then it got really hot in the summer. So all the water started, started to dry up. And they're still dumping stuff into this lake, mind you, for 10 years. Actually, like 16 years at this point. Um, so they're dumping stuff in this lake, and obviously it's not just going to like – disappear it's going to be like all fall to the bottom mm -hmm. and so all the water dries up and now this nuclear like shit is being exposed to oxygen drying up and is blowing in the wind this dust oh nice so another big ass cloud like terrorizes all these people and this time 41,000 people knew new lake Karashay's wrath so at least there's a bit of a number there. But I'm sure there was so many more people than that. Yeah. Um, this was the final straw for Lake Karache. And work began to cover the bottom of the lake with large cement blocks. So keep in mind, this is like, this is 67. And, uh, but just as they started to develop, like, the actual technology to make the lake safe, Chernobyl happened. So obviously, like, all the resources are going yeah. to that. And then in 1991... Uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, Lake Karachay was put on the back burners since, you know, 
a whole country needed to be rebuilt, and that's not the first thing on everyone's mind. Um, but even as late as 2004, nuclear waste was still being dumped in this lake. Wait, what year? 2004? Yeah. So from 48... No, I'm sorry. From 51 to 2004. That's almost 50 years. That's 47 years. 51? 51 to 04. That's 53 years. Yeah, you're right. Damn it. Okay. That's half a century of just being polluted with radioactive. Yeah. So in 2008, they were like, okay, we're done dumping shit into this lake. We're going to keep putting these cement blocks at the bottom. And in 2015, they finally filled in the bottom with uh, just cement blocks. And then they'd like, they put dirt on top of it. And uh, many people still live in City 40 and it remains pretty secluded still. I, I don't think I wrote down the actual name it is today. But there is, like, it's not just City 40 yeah. anymore. But, yeah, there's still, like, I don't know how many, but there's still people living there. So that whole town was irradiated. Not the town, but the lake, which is, like, right next to the town. No, I'm saying with, like, all the dust and shit blowing, wouldn't the whole town just be, like... I couldn't tell you. Because that stuff, it's not like the dust blows and just all the radiation stays there. It, like, it travels with those yeah. particles. Is there... Well, it said that there's, like... There's a shit ton of, like, cancer cases, and no one lives that long. Yeah. So, obviously, they're still fucked. <laughs> Do you know what that reminded me of? Have you seen Dark Tourist on Netflix? Yes. I think... Did we watch it here? We watched it at my house on Thanksgiving. Oh, yeah. Did we see the one with, um... Where you went to Japan? No, there's another one. I think it's Kazakhstan. I'm not... I think... It's one of those stands where that used to be controlled by the Soviets that was... And they would test a ton of nuclear bombs there. And this guy went to that place because it's like a dark tourist place. Mm. And dark tourism for people people who don't know, it's like they go on vacations to like dangerous places pretty much. They just want like to be in the danger. Mm. And he danger went zone? You highway, can't, I can't believe you just passed that up. Highway to the danger zone. Fuck yeah, dude. And this guy, he, the main guy in the series, he went to this, I think it was an orphanage. And kids to this day are still, like, being born, like, deformed and everything. We like, did watch that. It's, like, super depressing to watch. Like, it mm -hmm. still has, like, crazy effects on people. Like, I don't know if it's because the radiation is still there or if it's just because, like, their Genes. parents are affected by it. But, like, it's pretty depressing. Did it say if there's still, like, like birth defects and stuff happening there or just, like, people that just It just sick? said, like, cancer and stuff like that. I'm sure... It I'm sure it would happen there. Yeah. I don't know how much of that they would want to get out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, please. Hashtag double barrel business. Oh, the Badlands. Yeah. We watched the live stream, like, stream, live stream, like, right before uh, we started this podcast. I didn't know there was a live stream. Mm -hmm. I thought you were watching YouTube. Nope. Well... You want to get into Buck Nelson? Fuck yes, I do. I want to get inside him. Um, I don't know if he's still alive, but you can try. Okay. This book, it's called My Trip to Mars, the Moon, and Venus. And it's his story about being visited by Venusians. And Venusians, Venus. It's aliens <laughs> from Venus. So, the book starts out, it's pretty much just a preface of like who he is. He was born in Colorado. He lived in Colorado while all of this happened, so I'm just going to go into his first contact with the aliens. And this book, take it with a grain of salt, obviously. It's like on par with the last book on, the, on like craziness, but not it's not related yeah. to it. So it's the first contact. Buck Nelson on July 30th, 1954. He was listening to the radio at 4 in the morning when the radio started to act up and at the same time his radio started to act up, he's like, what's going on? And he heard his dog outside start barking, and he had a pony, and it was it was going absolutely nuts. So he went outside to see what was going on with his animals and to see, like, is there, like, an animal out here, like, trying to, like, get into the pen or something? Because he lives on a farm, like, in the middle of nowhere pretty much. Mm -hmm. So he went outside, saw his animals, and... He said he walked out onto his back porch and he saw a huge disc-shaped disc object 
and it was high up in the sky high and higher above this desk were two other ones so he went inside he grabbed his camera and he took took three pictures but when they were developed only two of the discs appeared i'm guessing it's the two that were higher up which one thing i wish he would have done was add some pictures to this book yeah there was not one picture there's like a diagram that he drew but it was about like the solar system so he developed the two he developed the pictures two discs appeared then he he said quote i don't know why but when i went back to the house to get the camera i had picked up a flashlight anyway i waved the flashlight at the things as a signal for them to come down and land instead of them coming down they shot some kind of ray at me it was much brighter and hotter than the sun i i certainly couldn't have stood it if i if it had lasted a few seconds longer the ray knocked him down like they shot him with his ray it, like knocked him off his feet and he waited for them to, to leave to get up like i think he said he got knocked behind a barrel so he then he was behind his barrel pretty much just like cowering because they shot him with this ray that was harder than the sun he didn't say if it like burned him or anything but he said when he got up he felt no pain from the lumbago and neuritis that affected his arm and back lumbago 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 oh, is it I don't, it's some something with his back. Yeah. And every time he moved pretty much for the last 15 years, he would be like in some sort of like discomfort or pain. He got up, he didn't feel anything. And he also no longer needed glasses to read. He said he sh he got shot with his ray, his vision got better, but it wasn't quite 2020. Like it was still kind of shitty, but not like, like the ray seemed to heal him. So that was it for the first contact. So we go into the second contact. He had like five contacts. February 1st, 1955, at noon, the disc circled his house. This is like a couple months after that happened. Um, they circled low over his house, and he said, I don't know if it was telepathic or like if he actually heard like from speakers. They asked him whether or not he was friendly, and I'm guessing he said yes, but he didn't say like what he responded as. But he says he thinks it was some sort of public address system, so I think it may have been like he heard it audibly. But in a lot of these stories, you'll hear like, that it, first off can you back up from the mic a little bit it's just i hear a lot of like oh sorry you're good but then they asked him if he could if they could land on his property where there was a spring like they i guess they needed water and without they wanted to land without him messing with them at like multiple times if they needed to and he was like i guess like go ahead you're obviously more advanced and powerful than me i can't really say no yeah um so they didn't land this time, and they talked for a few minutes, but they left and said, we will, we'll see you again. So that was the second contact. So, so far, it's just, he hears a voice. It's coming in. Um, third contact was March 5th, 1955, at midnight. They landed and came up to his house. A lot of these happen at midnight. So this time they actually came to his house, like the beings in the craft. And he said there were three men and a huge dog. One looked like he was from Earth. Um, his name was Little Buck or Bucky, which I thought was weird since his name is Buck Nelson. Mm -hmm. So if you hear me referring to two Bucks, if it's Bucky, it's the one that was on the craft. If it's Buck, it was him. So uh, another one was a man that was learning to work the ship. Like he was kind of like, he looked like an apprentice of some sort. And then he, they said he was friendly, but he didn't say anything. And there was another one named Bob Solomon. Like, they're all very, like, American names. Yeah. Um, he was apparently 200 years old, but he didn't look older um, than Bucky, who was 19 years old. So they all looked super young, but this guy was apparently 200. Uh, the dog's name was Bo, and he put his paw out to shake like it was a human. Like, I guess it just, like, I don't know, it was, like, interacting with him. So when Bo stood up on his hind legs, he was taller than Buck. And he found out Bo weighed 385 pounds. So a massive dog. Yeah. He said he had, like, really thick hair, but it was, like, it was really black, thick hair, but it was also, like, silky. Like, it was really light at the same time. He said he, said he got the hair um, analyzed, and it was, like, hollow hair, which I don't really know how that works. I don't know if that's a thing on, on Earth. Um, they stayed for about an hour. And they were very interested in his house and his belongings. Um, they also showed him how their 
stuff made less work than our our stuff. I guess like it was just easier, like made life way easier than us. This was in the fifties, by the way. Um, they also explained to him how their beds were half built into the wall and they had no sheets or blankets to wash. Um, they also said a canopy would come over their bed for privacy and like they had like dials and stuff that would control temperature so they didn't need blankets. So then Bob built them a fire to show them how like his fire worked, I guess, and they he showed him how his oil stove worked and he said the Bob guy almost burned his hand on it. A lot of weird details. Um then he explained how the radio and its battery, because I guess like his radio had a battery sitting on top. And he said they waved their hands over their head like this and said, what, with all the power of her head and you use that? Like, I don't know if they meant like solar power. And I don't, was solar power a thing back in the 50s? It might have been like infancy. But like, I don't know if this is before we discovered solar power. So he's like, what are you talking about? So... They also said that we have an entire misconception about religious figures when they saw a picture of Jesus on his wall. They're like, they're kind of pretty much like, he explained to them their religion. He was like, they're like, you kind of got this wrong. So. I'm sorry. It said 1839. Oh, wow. Okay. So I guess, I don't know if it was super public, but still they, he seemed to not really understand what they meant. Um, They also told him that he could take a trip to other planets if he would tell the world about it. So I would think it would be the other way around. Like, you have to keep it secret. don't tell it, yeah. But they said if you tell the world about it. So that was his third contact that came to his house, talked to him, left. The fourth contact happened on March 2nd, 1955 at midnight. Again, at midnight. Um, They circled his house. They didn't land, but they visited him. I guess they could somehow come down to the ground without landing their ship. But they told him to get ready for his trip to space. And... They cleaned out three springs behind his house because he told them that they could take water whenever they needed. So I guess they just used all of his water. They'd also placed 12 rocks in a circle, which they told him represented the 12 laws of God, which those were their only laws. They only had 12 laws. Um, So then, fifth contact, April 24th, 1955 at midnight. This was his space trip night. This is the night he was going to leave to go to space. They told him to put on the clean overalls because he had like clean overalls hanging drying and that he was not to take any belongings that could be magnetized. So he left his watch because he didn't want to ruin his watch. Um, he also took his dog, Ted. I thought that was a pretty cool name for a dog. Yeah. Um, so he took Ted with him. Before he left, he said he sat outside on the ship and they helped him write down the 12 laws of God. I guess they wanted to teach him what they were. And I have those on this page. Let me find it. While you're taking time to look at your thing, I got my video from Geography. Uh, I'd suggest watching their videos. I've watched a few of them before. They're pretty good. Oh, for the uh, the lake. Okay. Yeah. So these 12 laws of God. One, love your maker, God. Two, thou shalt not kill. And this, is, this includes accidents and wars. So like, okay. I guess if you accidentally like kill somebody like by complete accident it's still against the law threes love your neighbor so some of these are like sounding like the ten commandments Mm -hmm. four was let your light shine before men and all will see your god your good works and it will be an honor to you and your maker god five thou shalt not commit adultery six thou shalt not steal seven thou shalt not thou must do as as thou wish to be done so I guess if if you want something done you have to do it um, eight was no other God shall be before thee. Then they never really explained who their God was. Like if it was just like our God or, but nine was do not take the name God in vain. 10, honor your father and mother. 11, your body is God's. Do not misuse it in any way. Do not drink or eat anything that is not food. Use nothing to harm the body either inside or outside. Wear nothing on the body that harms it or is of no use. 12, God made the heaven and earth, and we must give him thanks for what he gives us. Um, and the following paragraph says, With these twelve laws of God and the rules governing them, all enclosed in a Bible of some twenty pages, their Bible is like twenty pages long, um, the other people of other planets in our solar system are able to live in order without wars, without armed forces or police, without tobacco, coffee, or tea, without liquor and harmful drugs, from the use of unrefined natural foods, diseases rare, but like very rare, 
Hence, no hospitals, no prisons, no sanitariums. The span of life is greatly extended. The cost of government is very small. The rule, the rules being based on truth and justice. So pretty much like, I guess just be a good person. Which, I guess if they're only laws like being a good person, I guess that's not horrible. So, where was I? Okay. After he, writ after he wrote these down, um, he said his only belonging belongings he took were like a pen and a pad of paper. They gave their dog, Bo, and Ted a bath in the spring. I guess this is for like ticks. They didn't want to bring ticks on the board. This, he said this later in the book. Um, they set him in the control panel and told him that it was very easy to fly the ship. They're like, you want to fly the ship? And he said once in space, he took the controls and he had the ship flying like erratically. And they were apparently like, they buckled their seatbelt for the first time in forever. I don't know why he put that. I guess it, they were like kind of like joking at him. But he said they were laughing and told him there's nothing that he could do that would harm them or the ship. So I guess they're just like, press whatever, like, whatever button you want. Mm. So their next stop was Mars. So now they get to Mars. He said when they got close, he saw horses and cattle in a field and landed in front of the ruler's home. And we have rovers on Mars. And I've never seen a horse. Yeah. <laughs> so, he said they all ate a big meal, and Ted was given a meal of fish that he loved. Ted, again, being the dog. Uh, the house was apparently built from rock from Earth's moon. And he was introduced as the Earth Man, and he was told that Mars had all kinds of races, but he was brought to people that were most like him. I don't know how that seems kind of iffy. But Mars was apparently a very colorful planet. He said when he looked out, he, like, couldn't tell where each color stopped and started. Like, it was just so colorful. Again, pictures I've seen, it's only red. Like, yeah. red, brown. Um, he said people of Mars used solar and electric power. Which, solar and electric? Like, I don't... Solar is electric. Solar uh, makes electric. Yeah, that's what... Yeah. I don't know what that means. Electricity? Mm-hmm. So next stop was the moon. So next he went to the lights out of the moon. And again, he went to the ruler's house first thing. And they ate another big meal. And this house was built into a crater. And it had a telescope and tables of rock samples. Like in like glass jars and stuff. It was just like a huge table of this stuff. Um, he said the quarries on the moon furnish rocks for building things on other planets. Whose surfaces like had degraded to only soil. Like there was no big rocks or anything they could build from. So uh, he said there's no vegetation and the water came from ice on the mountains on the moon. And that's not wrong, is it? I don't know. Is there, like, Maybe I'm thinking of ice on Mars. I know there's ice on Mars. And they did find uh, like ice on the moon, I think. So that's not But is there wrong. mountains? Is there mountains on the moon? I'm sure like craters and stuff. I don't know. He said there's huge mountains. And there's like cat with a, with ice. That's how they got their water. Um, he said their homes were also clustered around huge hangars that were used for interplanetary travel. He was also told that Earth was the only planet in the solar system system that didn't use an interplanetary travel. Then after this, they went to the dark side of the moon, and it was too hazy to really see the rivers and lakes that were apparently there, but he could still see huge mountains. And he said he went with Bo and Ted to look around, and Bo seemed to be like following them to like look after them. So apparently this dog seems more intelligent. Like it seems kind of like have some sort of like human intelligence. Like it's, I don't know, this, it's weird. He said there were children playing with many sized dogs and some rode Bo like he was a horse. And don't think that like, I'm just jumping around a lot. That's just how the book is. Like that's kind of like last week's book. It was just like one point and then completely different point. Their next stop was Venus. So they went to Venus. Buck lost all sense of time when they were flying there. He said he had no idea how long it took to get there, but he said um, it seemed like one thing they needed in space was like they needed to sleep a lot. So they made two stops on Venus, each at a ruler's house again. One ruler was wearing overalls with no buckles or hooks or anything, and he said they were made of some strange material. He, uh, he said when they got to the ruler's house, he was painting. So I don't know, like... I guess with no laws, they don't really have to do anything, so I don't know why they need a ruler. I don't understand, really. Um, he said they also had cars on Venus, but they hovered three to five feet off the ground. This eliminated the road, like the need for roads, and Buck said no roads, no police force, no jails, no government buildings, no wars. 
He also said everything was built to last a very long time there. Sickness was almost unknown to them, and on Venus it was almost as light as Earth, but um, like a little more hazy. And people only worked one to three hours per day. And I think we talked about Venus before. Didn't Russia send a probe there? And then like within three to five hours, the pressure just like destroyed it. I don't remember. I'm pretty sure they sent it. Like, I think it only lasted a couple hours before it was like completely destroyed because like the pressure and the extreme heat. I can't remember if that was Venus or Mercury. But Bucky, like the alien Bucky, also showed Buck what he called a book machine. And you can put in any book into this machine and it would read it out loud, play any music that was in it, and show any pictures that it contained, like, on the screen. Um, they ate again at both stops, and he said that they had a meal of meat, milk, eggs, salads, and cooked vegetables, and the only vegetable he recognized was corn. So he eventually got back to Earth on April 27, 1955. He said he was only gone for three days, two nights, and two half-nights. I, I don't understand the half-nights. Two half-nights. Oh, I guess maybe that means, like, the night he left at midnight, and then maybe he got back. Yeah, that makes more sense. So, he said at the three places he went, the people were very good-looking and didn't wear any jewelry or anything, and they didn't wear any um, clothing that, like, restricted their movement. I guess this is this goes back to that law where, like, not to wear anything that, like, does something to your body. I can't remember exactly what the law was. Um, they They are their own doctors, he said. And when he asked about diseases or cures, all they said was they lived by the 12 laws of God. So it seemed kind of like they were kind of cagey about it. And he said they used more natural remedies. He said he had like a rash because I guess the water there was different. And when he like got in it, it gave him a rash and they gave him like milkweed or something to rub on his body and it like got rid of the rash. Um, he said they also disapproved of competitive sports because it strains the body, especially the heart. Um, that kind of goes back to last week's where he said like the heart's the actual like pure um like the actual consciousness comes from the heart i don't know if that has anything to do with this excuse me excuse me again and they told him that they have some government officials up in their ships like from earth they had taken but they were too afraid of like they had too much to lose from telling the public like i was in a spaceship and they also offered him $1,000 not to talk about any of this, but he declined, which, big discrepancy in his story right there. Because do you remember when they told him, we'll take you up if you tell the story, but then they're like, we'll give you a $1,000 check if you don't tell your story. So the Venusians chose his ranch to land because he wouldn't try to sh shoot them down like the government, like they he presumed the government would. And his property was the perfect, when it comes to magnetic currents, he said... The currents at his ranch were like crossroads, I guess. And I don't know. I don't know apparently, his ranch was just perfect because they had a ton of water they could use. They had perfect currents. It was middle of nowhere. He they trusted him. Um, he said the moon also has something to do with her travel, which I think that's why midnight, because like the moon's out. I'm not. I don't know. So he also has his own saucer detector, which he hung in his house. And it has shown him that they've been to his property many times after this when they haven't, he said, like when they haven't visited him. He said it's like a string that you hang from the ceiling and you put like a bar magnet on it. And when the saucer's over your house, it'll like spin and then point to the <laughs> saucer. So go ahead and try to make one. If it spins, that means you're being visited. Um, so, shit, where was I? Oh, yeah. He, they didn't stop to contact him because he said he wouldn't bother them anymore. Um, he also says their ship looks like the classic flying saucer. It's about 50 feet across. It says it has like three sections, the top being like a big glass dome. And he said they can take off and land straight up or down, and they can change direction so fast. I guess like, you know, like the trope of like it can take off this direction, just go like that. He said the middle section spins, and that's how it like turns, I guess. And that's and they can hover and enter our atmosphere anytime, but can only. Well, I guess they can't only leave it, but the best time to leave is at midnight. Like, I don't know if that has anything to do with, like, how the moon is. Does the moon affect, like, magnetic currents? I don't know. Well, it affects, like, water. Yeah, I just didn't know if it would, like... I don't know. It doesn't affect, like, compasses, does it? Like, I don't think it does. But he also said it's impossible that it could actually have been a ship made here on Earth. Because I guess some people are like, are you sure, like... 
you didn't get on a ship from Earth and he just took you somewhere else on Earth that looked like weird. And he said, this is impossible because governments are too closely watched by each other to have such wonderful ships. And he doesn't think that scientists could have figured out this technology yet. But to be fair, he's a, like a guy that just lives in the middle of nowhere and doesn't really have contact with a lot of the outside world. So I don't know how educated he is. It sounds shitty, but like, do you know what I mean? Um, he also said the alien, the alien people said that if we accept them, they will show us how to live less troubled lives. And if we um, have another disaster of like biblical pr pr proportions, they will help us. Um, they will help those who accept them as brothers. And he said they still do speak, like out loud. That they also have mental telepathy, which that's like a common thing in alien stories. Like you, they'll say like they'll see an alien and they'll the thing will speak to them, but they won't see their mouth moving. Mm -hmm. So, he said he's back on the Bucky now, like the Bucky, like the nineteen year old or whatever that was on the ship. He said he went to Venus to work with them when he was seventeen, and he was actually born in Colorado. So, he also said his. He, I don't know if he met his parents, but his parents apparently got contacted and were asked to go, but they didn't want to, but they were like, you can take our son. So, um, one, when Buck wrote this book, he said Bucky was on Venus teaching English. And Buck later learned that he and Bucky were actually distant cousins. So, I don't know. It sounds kind of like a lie. Yeah. Like, they're this just... This guy's related to aliens. And we're well, I mean, this guy's bo Bucky was born on Earth in Colorado, but like two cousins, both named Buck. Yeah, and they're both taken to Venus. I, it's I don't know. He he later also thought that they had used a little bit of influence to get him onto their ship. Like it wasn't totally his idea. Like, hey, take me up on the ship. And oh shit, I think I skipped something. I think I may have notes. No, I don't. So. He also said some scientists came to his house and talked to him and were like asking about like how they took off when they took off. And he said he heard one of the scientists tell the other like he has been there. Like he said the scientists believe that he actually went to space. Or maybe they were uh, interviewing him to go to the, uh, the state penitentiary. Penitentiary? Yeah. Like For his fucking mind. Oh, like the, like, a, like an institute. Yeah. Um, They said that they said he has been there when he was talking about them about how there was bridges on the moon that gapped the craters so that they wouldn't have to actually use their spaceships to travel because they had those cars that would float three to five feet above the ground. Um, he also said the military started visiting his house and he said they, for some reason, they paid him $5 to move a post in his yard and not to tell anybody that he moved his post. I can't remember why exactly he said that. But apparently there's like one military guy he was like a younger guy that would like come to his house all the time and he was like he said he came in and he'd be like what's to eat dad like start calling him dad and shit like it was it's was very just it, it got really weird so bucky returned to visit him at 1 30 on a.m on christmas in 1955 he came back from venus and he left at midnight on the 26th so apparently he recorded bucky talking on like a tape recorder and he has his transcript in here so, this is his transcript. He said, I wish to tell all a Merry Christmas. And a special thanks to Fanny Lowry for her card. Because like, some lady came to him and like left him a postcard to leave to Bucky. And asked him. Because like, the postcard had like a bunch of monkeys on the car. Like putting gas in like the windshield wiper fluid thing. Like, quit monkeying around in my car or something. It was like the quote on the postcard. And so he said, also give her the answer to this question. Yes, it has happened to our ships. Torn apart for souvenirs. I appreciate such gifts, and I know that the giver does not expect anything in return, as we cannot exchange gifts with this earth. Many know the reason. Buck here can tell all that ask, which it never told why. Um, I will tell you why I am here. I have just returned from California, then on, to see, then on to see my folks in Colorado. Now here to see you, Buck, and tell the world on this tape recording that this world must give up atomic weapons and warfare. The next war if fought, all be on American soil. Will be on American soil. America will be destroyed, then civilization all over the world will be destroyed. We are here to see which way this world will use atomic power, for peace or war. We have stood by and seen other planets, one another, destroy itself. Is this world next? We wonder and watch and wait. So it kind of seems like they're like, like, what's going to happen next? 
He says again, I say, again, I say, give up your atomic weapons and peace and may peace be on this earth. I, I will tell Buck much more that he can tell the world. I know that Buck will want my time here to be spent in a private home like way. And I, I also desire it that way. So I must say goodbye to all the world from Bucky to Venus. So like, I'll get to like the atomic weapons when I'm done. I have a theory. Um, Buck also said that he was told that the pyramids were built with those stones and they said they used magnetic like tools to like lift the stones on to each other which didn't they just like um fuck what was it they just made some theory that like they poured the stones like concrete on top of each other like they didn't actually have to move them and he goes into the biblical flood for some reason like that was another theory well not a theory but like you know how I said, like, if another disaster happened, they would come back and help those who, like, survived. Um, so he goes into our biblical flood, and the it goes into Atlantis. So he said, Atlantis was a godly nation, largest of the known continents on Earth. They became wise, strong, and learned. But forgetting God, they wanted more power to provide more leisure, time, pleasure. They had not yet been a warlike nation. They had learned, They had learned of a power even greater than our atomic power. They had a great, long, large tunnel under their largest city. They were used for research and experimentation with this new power they were developing. In these experiments, this new power was let loose and Atlantis was destroyed. It was sunk into the ocean. This was our biblical flood. All known lands at this time were flooded as tidal waves were caused. And then, a North, then North America raised up out of the ocean. So any time we ever... Well, I don't know if we've ever gone into Atlantis on the podcast, but like any time I've heard about it, it's just like a bunch of crazy stories. Like, there's some theories that like uh, people started having sex with animals, and like it caused like moral degeneration, and like their country just went to shit, I guess, and like destroy itself. But there's also like a lot of religious stuff in this book. I found kind of strange. So Buck Nelson also says in 1956 that there are roughly 1,500 people from Mars and Venus in America. I guess just like scouts or whatever, just seeing like what's been going on. He says the Air Force has files about them and he believes that they should be open to the public because the truth could help the Earth people avert a nuclear disaster. And that's all from the book. It's, it was really like quick. The book's like 40, 50 pages long. And my theory on atomic weapons with this stuff, back when like Adamski, which Adamski apparently vouched his story because remember he met Venusians. Um, I don't believe it, just for the record. And he was also, like, the guy that was like, we need to give up atomic weapons because we're going to destroy ourselves. Back in the 50s and 60s when all the contactee stuff was happening, apparently the government had people looking out because he thought that they could be, um, like, Russian agents, like, trying to get us to denuclearize so they could be, like, the sole superpower. So I think... If this has any kernel of truth, I think that might be what it is. Like, it's, like, some other country, like, fucking with them. Just trying to get stories out there to, like, get more people, like, like that. But that's, like, about, that's about it for, it's a lot, a lot more underwhelming than I thought it would be, to be honest. The book, I thought it'd be a lot more, like, crazy. You look very tired. I am. I'm sorry, I was falling asleep. I can tell. But, yeah, that's all I have for Buck Nelson. It was just, it was a strange book. It seemed very religious at times. Yeah, it seemed a little weird. I didn't expect. I thought it was just going to be like. I got probed by an alien and they took me to Venus. To be honest, I expected some alien sex. Mm. Some of those stories get into that, but not this one. Do you remember that one we did like early in the podcast? Like, I don't know what you're talking about. It was pretty much just like sexual encounters with ETs. Mm hmm. I should get into some of those stories sometime because I didn't cover that whole book. But yeah, that's all I have for good old Bucky. So what are you going to do? You look all tired and I'm going to go home. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to wake up and be at work at 8. Okay. So you want to you wanna end it? I guess follow us on the socials. Yeah, Maybe anywhere you can up. find podcasts. You'll find us. Yeah. It has pretty much all our socials is, is like um, updates for the podcast and like very loose descriptions of our topics 
mm-hmm. stay up to date with us. Um, yeah, it's pretty much it. Anything else? Mm. What are your final words? Just know, we'll keep up to date with you, and Grandma wants to date you. <laughs>